And now, from the Marquee Media Studio inside Mark Tank, it's the Mark Haney Show. Are you ready, Sacramento? Uh, Rachel said she is ready. Uh, I am super excited about today's show. I've been looking forward to this for for months, really. Rachel Zillner is one of the most successful entrepreneurs in the Sacramento region, and she's won award after award after award, and she's uh, she's launched this incredible company based right here in Sacramento. So today we're going to get to know her, find out her uh, keys to winning, and really, uh, you know, find out a little bit more of why why Sacramento, because I know you're one of those people, Rachel, that uh, cares about our community a lot, mm-hmm. and uh, I know you're even on the GSEC board, so we'll dive into all of that and anything else that you want to cover as well. Um, so how you doing? I'm doing wonderful. Thanks for asking. Well, uh, thank you, and uh, maybe just uh, a little bit of your background. You are the founder uh, of Clutch, and that, that company has blown up over the last few years, so maybe just a little bit of your background and, and what led you to starting Clutch. Sure. So I'm actually a, a local Sacramentan. I grew up on the backside of American River College. I am the daughter of an entrepreneur. Aha. So my dad actually ran Allard Limousine, which was the premier limousine company here in our region back in the early 80s Aha. and mid through the mid 90s. Uh, and I That's decided- That's a tough business. Oh, it was. I, uh, I could probably <laughs> share, I used to own, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I used to own a limo company and uh, it was not easy. And uh, <laughs> but anyway, go ahead. Well, so, yeah, I will say that. So my parents got divorced when I was young. So I started running the limousine company from the time I was eight years old, oh, which sounds crazy, especially since I have an eight year old at home right now. And I'm like, yeah, OK, well, don't I people, could like, see call this. you in the middle of the night saying, can I get a ride? I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm stuck. Can I get a ride? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Those things I didn't handle. Okay. I handled all the things that happened after school or on the weekends. I book cars. I'd wash cars. I'd call drivers. I'd, I made it happen. So oh, wow. it was great. So you got you grew up in an entrepreneurial world, um, and then maybe fast forwarded a little bit, or maybe there's maybe we should even jump into are there life lessons that sort of um, prompted because you grew up in a really hard business, so it doesn't sound like you know that stuff is all that glamorous. You probably had to clean the inside of a limo once in a while, yeah, all the time. Uh, so that's not <laughs> a glamorous. Doesn't make you say, "Oh, I hope I get my own business when I get older." <laughs> no, actually, it didn't. Watching my dad um, actually deterred me from entrepreneurship because the limousine business is set up such that you're not home on the evenings or on the weekends because most events you're doing fall into those time frames. And I missed my dad. Mm. I really felt like, gosh, I I think it's so cool that he doing this, but I really want to be home and have dinner with my family or be able to go on vacations or do the things that we weren't able to do. So instead, I went into the corporate space. I mean, in all fairness, I could tell you some really funny stories about the small businesses I started from the time I was eight years old Uh. um, until I went to go be a Denny's waitress for a number of years and then went into banking and spent 20 years of my career in the credit union industry uh, and then started moving back into, you know, Maybe I could try the side hustle thing and see what this passive income side of the world would look like Um, from standing up a retail space. My husband and my brother and I opened an escape room company and ran that. We were the first in in this region, actually here in Rockland is where we opened. Okay, Um, Got those doors open seven years ago and learned so much in that sandbox of being an entrepreneur. Wow. You know what? I think we might be using your escape room for I'm taking all my grandkids Two, are there multiple rooms? Are there like two yes. rooms? Okay, yeah. yeah. And we're we're doing that for uh, their Christmas present. Oh, fun! I always do a Christmas thing uh, at the at, you know last year we went to a magic show or something. So this year's <laughs> escape room. So I think we're going to your place. So That's great. Anyway, uh, so okay, so you open the escape room. You've kind of yep. got the entrepreneurial bug, obviously. Yep. Yeah, I opened the escape room. I'd gotten some feedback at work that I was a little too much, um, and I needed to funnel some of that energy somewhere else. <laughs> Okay, how does that, how does, Rachel is a little too much. Was that on your performance review or was that like circling around the office to the company uh, employees? Probably a little bit of both. I was actually told, um, (laughs) I was actually told that I was the most disruptive employee that our head of human resources had ever worked with. And I said, thank you. (laughs) 
<laughs> that fit Wear me that perfectly. Badge. That's right. I love it. So I actually channeled some of that energy into opening up the escape room. We decided that we were going to open it. And six weeks later, we had our doors open, um, which is unheard of. But we thought, you know, I, if anything I'm going to do, I'm going to put my head down. I'm going to just mm-hmm. knock it out. So we had a great relationship built with the city of Rockland, got all of our inspections done, worked with a, a contractor and opened our first room. And we were profitable from our first month forward. Wow. So just a really wonderful experience. Not normal. Yeah, right? that doesn't sound like what I've been exposed to. <laughs> well, the region was hot for it, right? Mm. Like there wasn't anything like that. And like you said, you're taking your your family to go play an escape room. They're such a fun, just good, clean family brain exercise, laughing, memorable thing to do. Mm. So it was bringing joy to people's lives. Like I was all about it. Yeah, <laughs> Let's figure this out. Fun. I've never been to an escape room. So oh, you're going to love it. Yeah. The puzzles are great. I would dream them and then my husband would figure out how to put the tech in place. So mm. it was pretty great. Okay. So you got the escape room and you're off on the right foot mm-hmm. and then how far do we have to fast forward to clutch that was like 2019 so yeah clutch started in 2019 so i would say four years later um i hit a wall in the corporate space where i just felt like i mean i was built the brand for safe credit union in the community we had done a number of just like epic year after year through different product launches and ideas and i just felt like i could do this for myself And I had three amazing men in my life that one I met on an airplane, um, Kit Blewett with Rubicon Partners. Um, One is a wonderful elected official I sat next to on an airplane that talked to me about, said I wasn't going to make any real money till I quit my job. And the other one was Casey Kutua, who told me if I had the financial, if he had my financial chops, he would be through the ceiling. And Casey uh, is a, a, so you're also in the Entrepreneurs Organization, as am I. And so is Casey, who owns a very successful printing company yes. here in town. So, OK, so you so you had some encouragement from the politicians, <laughs> which is kind of like, OK, but when you get it from an entrepreneur like Casey, yeah. that's, that makes, uh, you know, probably uh, helped uh, yeah. prompt the, the decision. Yeah, the guys helped me really believe in myself. I mean, I had lots of great mentors in my life and in this space, and it just kind of felt like the universe had continued to tell me just do it, just do it, take the jump, do the thing. And one day I came down particularly frustrated from a meeting and Anne, I went into Anne Descalzo's office, my co-founder, and I said, Anne, if I ever left, would you come with me? And she said, hell yeah, I would. Wow. And I was like, oh, you would? Oh my gosh, seriously? And then my brain just started exploding with like, if I had Anne, I feel like I could take over the world. She's really the yin to my yang. She's my co-founder. Like we're, we are work wives. We are married and it <laughs> works, you know, like it just, she can do everything I can't. And she really keeps me grounded because I can float off um, onto the, the other planets that mm-hmm. exist out here. Mm-hmm. And so together we started whiteboarding. What do you want to do? How do you want to do this? And what we landed on was it was going to be about the core values of how we managed ourselves and how we represented ourselves as leaders and the, the, the culture really of what type of organization we wanted to build. So we landed on connection, uh, drive, and optimism. We wanted those three things to be in every part of what we touched. We were super intentional about it being just three so that later in life we could add more if we wanted to. and. It's been a beautiful journey. So what does Clutch actually do? It's a cool name. It's short and sweet. <laughs> you, your, your core values are short and sweet mm-hmm. and easy to re- recall. Um, but what is Clutch? So Clutch, we do a lot of different types of consulting. We have, for us, we say it's about the people, not the project, which means we find work that we find interesting or passionately something we want to be a part of. And I'll just expand on that a little bit because this is one of the harder things because it's not your normal like, hey, this is the niche we work in. Hey, this is the one thing that we do really well. We are great at letting people authentically show up as who they are and getting shit done. Then you apply that to whatever project it might be. So anything that is 
a point of friction in a company. Anytime maybe they're installing a new software and they need people to come in and figure out the whole operational process and document it, we can do that. Anytime there's a new startup, if you're going to build something from the ground up, we have some legit grit around here. Mm -hmm. (laughs) We know how to take nothing and turn it into something. So you go into businesses that need some help and you help you help them to solve these problems mm-hmm. in the clutch, it sounds like. Mm-hmm. And maybe give me an example of uh, something, something you're super proud of that you that clutch has done. Sure, I have so many, but I'll pick from one of my personal favorites. Um, during the pandemic, we received a call that there was a, basically the state of California had to roll a vaccine out across the state of California and they had never done that before in this way to move this quickly and make it happen and they were working with how to certify providers that they could get this vaccine rolled out to our team came in got everything set up from the call center perspective and got it all moving within two weeks okay and you don't stand up call centers and make them run in that way in two weeks so we just knocked it in and got it done yeah um, so you have you have like hundreds of employees. We have 180 employees. 180 employees. So to stand up a call center, you need people that not only understand business, they know how to lead people because I know that's not easy. My wife worked at call center uh, when uh, Katrina happened. They, they yep. flew her in. She was HR director at the city of Roseville and they flew her in and You know, it was a smooth running machine, but it was stood up like what you're talking about very, very quickly. And she was sort of blown away because in those in that emergency, you have to have people answer the phone all of a sudden. And you you need a lot of bodies, but you you really need leadership. Yeah. And you need to centralize information and data and communication so that people are giving out the right answers as opposed to just kind of taking what's coming. And it's it's just we really like to do things that have a way to remove friction in an organization, that have a way to show a different way to show up. But usually in crisis, people go to some of their natural things, which can be anger or treating people poorly. And a lot of those those behaviors that we have when we're under stress or in crisis actually push our employees away. And then they don't react in a way that you would be super proud of, or they're not engaged, or they're sick a lot because they just can't see themselves at work because it's not a healthy work environment. And we lean into the people to create space for them to show up. And if it means they're having a tough day and they can only do half, I'd rather take a half of your time than not your time for the next six days. And it, we were able to move faster than most wow. bodies of people. I in probably that space. could have used the optimism piece of your core values on that call center because when COVID mm-hmm. hit for us, you know, we have this co-working space. I've got this uh, face-to-face podcast, and uh, we're basically and we do events and things like that for entrepreneurs. We stopped, sure. and we were. I mean, I had. PTSD from 2008 and the financial crisis. Yeah. And then all of a sudden that happens. I could have, so when we, they, when we called up, what did we, and what information did we get from you? What, uh, like we called your oh. call center. <laughs> How, like when you probably yeah. got some crazy calls, panicky oh guys gosh. like me. Sure. We took, well, okay. So we also stood up the public facing call center for California department of public health. Okay. So that was the, the vaccine side. So the, um, basically all the doctors and people that wanted that wanted to pass out vaccine but we did the public oh. facing as well and we took 26 million phone calls over the pandemic oh uh, and we worked with a partner we managed the vendor who ran the call center but we were responsible for the QA and all of the comms and I mean, just spread out across the different needs for the state of California. Because you have to imagine business owners are calling, housing is calling, landlords, tenants, sick people, people who are stuck in their houses. We had to touch all of the things and provide information for that. So yes, we would get hourly updates through the governor's office. We had people working 20 hours a day to push out the comms updates into the call center. So we had the most up-to-date info. So we could tell you, hey, this is um, this is what the classifications for essential business are. This is um, the type ha- where you can get the materials that you need so that you can be open. Here's the stuff that you can print out. Um, here's how you can host a something and here's resources for you to call. Wow. It's just, we we centralized all of that information. Amazing how you have to sort of learn some, well, in, in COVID, we, we had to learn something new. So you have to have mm-hmm. creativity and you have to be able to think on your feet to, to get stuff done like that. Yeah. Um, 
But you started the company in 2019, you and Anne, yes. and now you have close to 200 employees. Talk to me about that growth and maybe you can synthesize maybe some key principles because you're a work, uh, you know, that affected that, uh, that success because you're a working mom. You know, you've, you know, you've obviously done so much for our community. You're an angel investor. You have all these things, but growing a company from that, from 2019 to today to close to 200 employees, that's remarkable. Thank you. That is remarkable. Well, what's uh, walk me through that journey and maybe you can break down any principles that you maybe have learned or took to that effort. I don't, I don't necessarily know about principles, but sometimes I say them and don't realize how to classify them that way. Mm -hmm. So forgive my naivety in that space. Uh, but I believe in radical optimism. So I believe that there is a way to get there. You have to start thinking about what's possible instead of what you can't do. Because a lot of times we can sit in a space of, oh, well, I can't do that. Who could make that happen? And it's, it's more about, okay, what is the thing? What's the next step I could take? What's the next right step? What, how can I move in that direction? What resources do I have available? And for us, I mean, yes, Clutch has 180 employees, but during the pandemic, there was a need for so many hands, sets of hands to do all these various tasks that many people had never done before and there was no protocol for. So first of all, we had to be comfortable being decision makers, which means you have to be comfortable failing. Mm -hmm. You have to be comfortable making a wrong decision. You have to be comfortable quickly checking in and building relationships with people around you to see, hey, would you support this? Could you get behind this? Do you see any problems in this? Building relationships with them so they answer the call because you have to imagine they're getting a hundred calls an hour mm -hmm. right from people who need something from them so i would say having that um radical optimism that you can figure it out is the beginning yeah and then understanding i, like, I, I have my mantra up there yes if uh, everything is figure outable mm. if you have the right people and you you get a few things right but um I, I like that. Go into it with that mentality. Yes. Okay. So I'll check that one is like key. That's huge. Yep. You're already starting out ahead. And then, um, I don't know, this one makes some people crazy, but I, I believe in limitless thinking. Anne and I subscribe to limitless thinking. Okay. Can you expand on that? Certainly. So uh, here's an example I can give you. Uh, I was sitting on a call with a couple other consulting companies and there was uh, a real need to get COVID vaccine records fixed so that people could have all of their data and their information on what was going to be a digital vaccine card, which, I mean, if you lived in LA, you couldn't go anywhere without showing proof of vaccination. Okay. And our, most of our population in California is in LA County. So <laughs> we were working diligently uh, to support this effort. Well, I could hear in the tone of the other consultant company who was being just bombarded with questions about when are you going to get this done? How are you going to get this done? I need you to hire 300 more people. I need you, like they were trying to pull through. I mean, we have 40 million people in the state of California. It's a lot of work to do at a fast pace. And I called Ann and I said, I think they need our help. Um, I don't really know this guy. Do you think it's okay if I just call him and say, do you need help? And she's like, why not? I'm like, all right, why not? We can do it. We can help with whatever it is that they might need. So I called him and I said, hey, um, I feel like you need people. Do you need people? And he said, oh my gosh, yes, I need people now. And I said, how many people do you need? And he said, I need like 90. No, I need like 100. And I said, great, when do you need them by? And he said, yesterday. This was on a Tuesday. And I said, okay, I could get you 100 people by Friday. Would that work? And he said, are you kidding me? And I said, I'm not kidding. If you need them and we can work out that it works for everyone involved, I can get you 100 people by Friday. And he was like, uh, yes, it's a yes, right? <laughs> <laughs> How do we do this? Right? <laughs> yes. you, have, you start with that optimism. It's figure outable. Yep. I need 100. So how did you do it? We hired 110 <laughs> people by Friday. Oh, my God. <laughs> and did you in in the LA area or did you no nope, it the was state? remote position okay. and I felt I felt like I mean when the pandemic happened I was sitting at home wondering how I could support and what I could do and I knew lots of people who are in that same space that are just looking for, what can I do put me to work and mm. and I don't you don't have to go in right and this was at the time where we were all afraid this thing was going to kill everybody right. right we didn't have all the information and so it was like, okay, who, 
hello students, hello former Starbucks bartistas, like what what are you doing? Do you want to do this? And we taught them how to work in a remote environment and we put them to work and they got going. Wow. Yeah. And they supported this uh, panic attack, if you want to call it that, <laughs> right? Because we all sort of panicked sure. a little bit. Yeah. And wow, okay. Yeah. That's amazing that you took on that job. So you is that sort of part of the, uh, the clutch process is... Um, you see a need, it might be a hundred people, it might be, you, you provide that manpower to, or person power yeah. to solve these problems. We can do that. Okay. I wouldn't say, I would say it's probably five or 7% of our business. Okay. It's a very small portion. Um, in the pandemic, it was much larger because it was like, oh my gosh, everyone needed people everywhere. Now we spend a lot of our time doing a lot of different programs set up and start up. Um, and supporting business coming into our region, helping them stand up operational processes, doing their comms, their marketing, all that good stuff. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, so thinking about, okay, so you've built this incredible business, maybe just uh, because it's grown so fast, what's the vision? Uh, mm -hmm. Because it's you guys are brand new. As, well, as I look, I'm an old man, but to me that seems like <laughs> a brand new business. Yeah, I mean, sure, from a time, if if you believe time is linear, right, which most people do. It's, it's not? four years. And it's not always linear. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're a little over four years in this space. So, yeah, I mean, I feel like I'm an old soul, and you get to take the things that you've learned from other spaces and apply it in. So while Clutch itself is new, all of the experiences that Ann and I have had and our very mature executive team has had in their past lives, right? They get to bring to the table and put it all into play in one spot. So what's the longer term vision? We are working towards being a thousand employee organization and I'm I'm coming for Accenture. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yep. You heard it here, folks. Uh, <laughs> if there's any Accenture people listening, we are coming <laughs> after you, baby. Right? Entrepreneurs are coming after that's you. Right. <laughs> uh, I love it. Um, so that's that's really uh, amazing and Thank inspiring. You. And so at a thousand people, you, you that's the kind of thing where rules in, we had a company that got up to like 300 people. And I used to joke that, look, there's a job. So you like your job now is this. And when we get to, you know, at that, we never, we got to a thousand after we sold and merged with another company, but we, well, it was just me and my brother. We never got to a thousand, but sort of joked about there's a, there's every kind of job in the world. So you might be in this kind of role now, maybe it's cleaning the bathrooms, yeah. but, uh, as we grow opportunities, uh, you know, they're everywhere when you're in a fast growth company. So yes. people just sort of just put on new hats. It may be, Oh, you want to go to HR? Okay, there'll be an opening at HR at some point if you're, yeah. you know, if you're built for it. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it makes for beautiful career pathing opportunities. Mm -hmm. We already have demonstrated that our team members are able to move into different areas and try different things. And I mean, that's the dream right there yeah. is being able to put your, your body into an organization and say, I think I want to do this. Okay, actually, that looks interesting. I'd like to do some time over there. Maybe there's a, a an internship or something I can try or even just stepping into it on a trial basis. Yeah. But we've had great movement in our organization. Growth companies, especially entrepreneurial growth companies, they create so much opportunity. They do. Have you, have you seen people... Um, that really sort of transformed themselves uh, in the last four years within I, that team? I see it, but probably not in the way you're you're thinking about it in a traditional company space, because yes, people can take their skills and get the opportunity to try new things, and then they transform into being a savant in a particular area. At Clutch, we actually, our employees go through what we call very lovingly like a detox because you generally come with these preconceived notions about how a corporation works or perhaps had a traumatic experience in your last space or maybe it was a toxic work environment and people come to our space and then it's like, is this for real? I mean, someone joking was like, is this a cult? And I was like, oh gosh, are we? I don't know. What does that mean? But no, we are definitely not a cult. I looked it up. <laughs> That's interesting. I've, uh, I've never heard that um, phraseology as relates to a employee or a team because the team is so different. It yeah. feels like a detox or do you actually do something that detox, you know, that uh, cleans out their system? No, they, they it feels like a detox. It, it's, um, I, I'm not quite sure how to put words to it, but all of our team members could speak to it to explain to you that 
it's so different than anywhere they've ever worked before that it's it's a full mental reset, right? Like we have these walls that we put up. So if you go into a meeting, you go into the, a meeting with these preconceived notions, you're going to have to defend your perspective. Or if someone's asking a question, they're asking because they don't believe in you or whatever these things are that we show up to our places of work with. We don't have those at Clutch. We have an open, curious environment. But when new people come into it, it presents, they present like, oh, I I have to pull back. And then they figure out through time that this is the new normal, that here we ask questions and we ask very curious, gentle questions where we actually don't, we will not hire or maintain employment for brilliant assholes. We have a no brilliant assholes rule at Clutch. Mm -hmm. So you can be super smart, but if you can't figure out how to play nicely with others, then you can't be here. That's, I've never, I've heard of like other kinds of rules. Um, Do you, okay, so that's, I love that. And because the brilliant asshole uh, rule exists, uh, then that, people in every company there's usually somebody like that yeah. or even in small businesses that well that person has all the information so we can't lose them even though they are <laughs> you know uh, you know, they're brilliant but they're you know they're they're hard to get along with yeah most every company has somebody like that mm-hmm. and you when you sniff that out you're like see ya yeah yeah we have op- so we have accountable conversations with each other at all levels in the organization we talk to our employees about and ask them to help us reinforce our core values so that we all remain positive and optimistic with one another and that we stay connected we open our our meetings with a few minutes to start with check-ins human check-ins we bring the whole human to the table so you and i would sit down and have a conversation about what you did this weekend or how things are going with your dog or your car or whatever life situation reminding us that we're all humans so that we don't treat each other like we're not human Um, it's a missing piece of the puzzle for a lot of organizations and it's something we're really proud of well with close to 200 employees and on your way to a thousand it's easy to lose track of the individuals that make Mm -hmm. it happen because at some level you don't have time to talk to everybody uh, Mm -hmm. on a daily basis anymore. You might at the beginning, but then pretty soon now you're relying on, you know, other leaders to, to help run the company. And so how did they spread you? How do you get your message to the team now with a, with a close to 200 uh, person company? Uh, We're very intentional in our new hire orientation. We're very intentional in our hiring process. We do a culture based hiring process so people really understand the organization that they're applying to work for and then we have regular i mean right now we are a mostly remote workforce so we have a That's monthly be more challenging it in is. a way oh certainly yeah yeah because you don't get to be physically together so you're missing the body language part of connection that takes place between two human beings so we do a monthly optional uh, co-working day and our team members love it. So of our 180, I think at our last event, we had about 110 there. So really high attendance. What is, okay, so optional co-working day, so that people show up somewhere? Yeah. Okay, what happens? Yeah, we basically rent an event space and we all get together in the event space. We sit at rounds of six or eight people. We cater in lunch and we say show up between whatever time in the morning and go back home when you need to. people all in Sacramento, in the Sacramento region? So would you do it? in a more central place or do they come here or you have people come in here to Sacramento? We've been using the event space at Granite City. That's the co-working oh, yeah. space we have above and they have the event space below. And then we borrow space from the Natoma. Granite City is a co-working space in Folsom. That's yes. right. Yes. And we have employees in 21 states. So they also have the option to fly in and come hang out with us wow. and many choose to do so. So cool. Yeah. Um, those cultures, uh, I mean, that that has to be a huge driver in the success is their uh, radical optimism as they yeah. catch that bug. It yeah. just catches like wildfire. Yeah. Everyone gets to do the things that they enjoy doing. And we work hard and not everything is glamorous, right? But at the end of the day, we're all choosing to do this together. Wow. Exciting stuff. So you are a, we talked about this a little bit at the beginning before the show. And I said, you're a working mom. You have two kids. You have an eight and 10 year old. And you quickly uh, said, well, it's 
no different than being a working dad. <laughs> that's like, right. Well, that's not what I heard, but okay, expl- <laughs> elaborate on that because it sounds hard to me because I look at what my wife did. It's like, oh, that, that looks hard. Well, uh, <laughs> well, sure, let's keep it real. I mean, the... I was the only breastfeeding parent in our house, okay. right? That's one differentiator. That's yep, yeah. it's a whole thing. Um, but my kids are well beyond that at the ages of eight and 10 now. Um, so David and I very much, my husband is David, we very much believe in partnership. I mean, when we decided to sign up for this life together, it was very much in partnership. We were super clear that we were doing this together. And so I guess in a way, we're, we are a household that is very, very clear on we do this together. It's always been a partnership. Partnership. So, um, so I'd be grounded I, at home for sure. Is, oh, yeah. You know, huge. And I was lucky to have that too, you know, as an entrepreneur growing up, uh, you know, trying to build businesses and my, I, my wife worked too. So, but yeah. we were, we were aligned and yeah. that alignment was, is still enormous for, you know, smooth operating yeah. of a, of a family. Yeah. You and your wife have a lovely, a lovely partnership. We're lucky. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm a good salesman. <laughs> yeah. I love it. Good for you. Yeah. yeah. So. I, well, so David and I, we do a, that thing. In fact, there's like a game. I can't think of the name of it, but someone makes this game that you can buy. It's like a card deck that has all the responsibilities of a household and you can look at those and then understand, um, you know, if there's a job to make lunch for the kids, right? Well, then that job consists of deciding what the children are going to have for lunch, purchasing the things that the children are gonna have for lunch, and then getting them into the lunch, right? And so when our kids were younger, the kids couldn't help with that, and it would be about deciding who's gonna do what and have that be in a partnership. Our kids are older now, eight and 10, and we've had a rule, well, I don't know if it's our rule, it might've been my rule. Um, If you are a Zillner, you have to be autonomous. So my oldest daughter from the time she was six was making her own breakfast, right? Which meant a whole lot of cereal and milk on the floor in the morning. So you're self-reliant as a how old? (laughs) At six, you gotta make your own lunch. Oh my (laughs) goodness. Yeah, that's good. it, It was teaching them their part, right? It was like, what are the things they could do, right? And that was something that they were capable of doing. We put bowls on the lower shelves, put the milk down below. And these are things I learned from other parents that were willing to share their trade secrets. <laughs> well, you hear more about these days uh, about helicopter parents and things like that that are hovering to make sure everything's yeah. just right for Johnny and all that. And that he, you know, if he doesn't make the baseball team that you go, uh, you know, have it out with the coach and all that kind of <laughs> stuff. It's like, wow, we're, we've really uh, taken away a lot of the autonomy sure. in, in growing up in, I, I think in society you've sort of gone back. I feel like that's old school because that's how my mom was too. <laughs> okay. They do say the pendulum swings. Uh, yeah, interesting. But I I feel as a mom or as a parent even, my responsibility is to the emotional regulation, the emotional intelligence, uh, the emotional support of my children. And I'm not saying that any every parent has their own system that they use. For us in our house, that's something that matters to me. When I'm home, which is not every night because I'm working a lot, I go to a lot of events, I'm very committed to our community. Um, I lay with both of my girls at bedtime and ask them questions about their life. I ask them how they felt about it. And then we talk through even like role playing, Mm -hmm. almost like you would from a sales culture of like learning how you speak to another person. And we choose words and I ask them if they understand what that word means. I have them define it for me. That's how I show up as a mom um, to take the skills that I have to put back into my children. Do they go to public school? They both are at Orangeville Open. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So then they're going to public school because a lot of people are homeschooling these days yep. or taking the kids out of, you know, the standard, uh, you know, standard schools or whatever, the public schools. Um, so uh, this is interesting. I wasn't really expecting to talk about parenthood, but it's probably my favorite subject. Is, <laughs> it's like talking about entrepreneurship. I love it. So what do you, so, and I'm watching my, I have eight grandkids, so I'm yeah. watching the dynamics in our family uh, mm-hmm. unfold. So when do, when does a kid get a cell phone? Is that at 10, 12, <laughs> 18? Yeah. Have you started thinking about stuff like that yet? We talk about it a lot. We haven't crossed that threshold yet. And I think, 
I mean, every family has to choose what's right for them. I'm actually more concerned about the kind of things that kids get exposed to through social media. And I feel really blessed. Um, My husband is a nerd. I married a nerd. He's an IT savant. And he's been able to lock our kids down from a lot of At least he's not an asshole. You don't fire him. (laughs) Yeah, well, that wouldn't work, obviously, (laughs) with the rule. Um, But he was able to lock everything down um, so our kids can play a little bit of roadblocks and some some stuff in Mm -hmm. that space. But we have not yet issued cell phones. Yeah. Um, I would like to keep them away for as long as possible when yeah. they start driving for sure. I just don't know between 10 and 16 what that age will be. Okay, so here's one question I don't think I've ever asked on the show before. So when your child is in trouble, my mom and dad, uh, you know, they were old school in the way they approached it. But how do you how do you handle it if your child is uh, misbehaving and you need to uh, provide punishment? Um, so we have a lot of open conversations. Uh, I I love, okay, <laughs> my oldest child is probably going to run for office someday. My youngest child, we lovingly say we're probably going to bail out of jail someday. <laughs> and I mean that. And they're a, both girls. They're both girls. Okay. And the youngest one is going to go to jail for right fighting or defending oh. someone from bullying. Like she is oh. a like protector in like the best most beautiful way but she also has really bright emotions so we're currently teaching her that um you know you don't immediately go to violence you don't immediately (laughs) kick someone i should have taught that to my son (laughs) (laughs) it's these fun little these fun little things you every child has a different personality Mm -hmm. so we're trying to customize plans to them which isn't always the easiest we're certainly not perfect so you don't have to punish the kids then they sound like a perfect kid no god no that's not a thing we um have used timeouts in the past i feel like i watched super nanny a lot mm-hmm. and that like the number of minutes for your age we haven't had to do timeouts for a long time um, generally we say hey do you see what you're doing here how do you think that made that person feel mm. and they recognize an emotion with it and then they they have learned to apologize but they don't just say i'm sorry they say i'm sorry that i blah 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 mm-hmm. right whatever this is here and then we'll say i'd like for you to not do that again can you do that or do we need to have a longer conversation about it? And sometimes they'll say, I, I don't understand what I did here or, and then we can mm, talk about it. Yeah. But there's there's more talking in our house than anything else. The knowledge, the intelligence side of it has, has been the way that we've figured out how to do it in our home. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's great. Um, okay, so let's talk about Sacramento and the Sacramento region. You are... Are you on the board of GSEC? Yes. You're involved with the Greater Sacramento Economic Council, which for anybody listening, they are sort of the overseers and driving force behind economic vitality within our within our region. They've rallied successful entrepreneurs at some level, uh, a lot of the bigger businesses and a lot of the cities and municipalities all coming together to help uh, drive our economy and some of the vision behind um, how to take our economy to the next level. So now they bring in, entre- I love that they brought in an entrepreneur. So me too. Me, because it's like, it's expensive to be on the GSEC board. And mm-hmm. um, and so it, people would, might shy away from that, right? A, a city might be able to throw in some money out of their budget or a large corporation, but bringing in an entrepreneur to get your perspective, especially a fast growing person who knows how to win, to me, that's brilliant from GSEC. Mm -hmm. So uh, what's it like doing that and why did you decide to join? So when, when Barry Broom landed here a little over eight years ago, I thought this is such a cool thing that we're going to be doing in this region. And it went on my bucket list or my vision board of like someday I would just love to serve our community in this way and sit on this board. Yeah, Dave Routon was on the board, right? Yeah, Mm -hmm. okay, that's right. Okay, he's a safe credit union, former safe credit union CEO. CEO. So Mm -hmm. I figured he was the CEO at that time. So yeah. (laughs) Okay, so you you saw that happening and thought, Okay, that became aspirational for you. Sure. Okay. Yeah. And why? Well, okay. So at the time, I was the chair of Metro Edge, which is the largest young young professionals organization here in the region. Part of Sac Metro Chamber of Commerce. Totally. Yeah. And Barry landed with GSAC, and immediately he started putting in things in place that would make us a winning region, a winning city. Right. I mean, GSAC is now the third highest performing organization in the nation, and it's right here in our backyard. I mean, we have one hell of a guy running Mm -hmm. the show in that space. So he came in and started saying, these are all the things that we need to do. One of those was to engage young professionals. 
And I made a very loving, very passionate plea to Barry's team to please not reinvent the wheel. We already had Metro Edge and let's find a way that we could share the support. And um, Barry and I had never met, but he invited me to his office to have a meeting and he did this wonderful job of whiteboarding how GSAC works, how the economic engine works, where the financials come from, checking in to see if I needed further information. And I'm like, nope, I'm good, keep going, keep going. And at the end of our conversation, we hugged it out. He gave me a kiss on the cheek and he said, thank you for being so passionate about this region. It's palatable. And I felt like he could see me and I could see him. And it was like, OK, there was no no um, further intrusiveness between the two organizations. We found a way to work together. Sounds like you brought out the so- softer side uh, for a second there, <laughs> Barry Broom, because anybody who knows Barry Broom uh, uh, at any level, if you've ever heard him speak i mean this guy is he's a maverick he he is is. a driver and he's you know he's a former wrestler from cleveland ohio and (laughs) he's just tough as nails and rachel zillner brought out the softer side (laughs) obviously he's a creative visionary and you know i can see him with the whiteboard but uh that's that's really cool and so then what happened with that after that so yeah, we had our great conversation. We actually aligned with the organ- the the folks that they had in that space at the time. Um, one of those being Amanda Blackwood, mm-hmm. and then Amanda went on a couple of years later to be the CEO of the Metro Chamber, and that was a really great uh, cross pollinization between those two organizations. And I mean, I went on to sit on the Metro Chamber board to run to be the chair of the Metro Foundation board. Uh, I'm very committed to this region. I want to make sure that we leave it better for that next generation, for your grandkids, Mm -hmm. for my kids, for their next space. I just, this city, this region has so many incredible people that are wonderful resources to one another. I went through the Leadership Sacramento program and it just changed my life on how I looked at civic engagement around our region and everything you could need to do business and make millions of dollars and change millions of people's lives is right here in our backyard. Well, it's interesting that you have carved out that kind of, I guess, uh, time to give back to our community where you've got this business that uh, businesses that need to, you know, need to thrive so you can put food on the table and you can create, continue to create opportunity and, and reach your vision. Yet you're carving out part of your personal time to to help the rest of us which is uh, inspiring i think is a lot of people are like oh, i've got my head down i got my own job to do we get we get a little selfish sometimes and sure. you uh who inspired did that come from your mom or your dad was that was your dad that way sounds like he was buried in his business it actually came from my grandfather oh. so my grandfather was um we're a military family so my grandfather um served in world war ii uh, he was actually mm. a prisoner of war for 186 days uh wow. in germany and is he still alive he passed away a few years ago from leukemia um but granddad was a, such a giver back to the community i mean i just aspire to be like this man. He was always giving back, very active in our church, very active in Rotary. He was a Mason. Um, He was just always giving, paying it forward to other people. And I really admired that about him and trying to live in the same space. Well, World War II veteran prisoner of war my gosh yeah. what a what a hero um and was he an entrepreneur too or was he no no my okay. grandfather was a principal at oh. uh at dry creek and dry uh, creek elementary yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow yep he wow. taught he spent his whole life teaching my grandmother was a teacher as well so yeah really interesting okay so i can see where the passion comes from and carving out that time caring about our community and thinking long term. What do you see for our vision for Sacramento? I'm sort of in that same uh, belief system that, you know, I want to create something better for my grandchildren. And so that's why I'm helping entrepreneurs. And, you know, I feel like entrepreneurs are the heroes of the American economy. And because we create the new jobs and the innovation and we figure out a way to change the world. So I think entrepreneurship is super important, which is sort of my passion. Um, But what what do you see as Sacramento's trajectory? We have Barry, who you described as a as a, as the right leader for yeah. economic development. But in terms of the economy, what's what's the right uh, what's the right vision for us? Yeah, I 
I'm not going to say that I have all the answers. It's certainly not my area of expertise, but I can say what my my dream, my vision casting in this space is, is to continue to plug in, is to continue to give back, is to, we've got a lot of vacant space in our region um, all over the place that- Are you talking about real estate? Real estate, mm. yeah. Their yeah, offices are becoming- Vacant. Yeah. If we're going to support other other entrepreneurs, we have to put people adjacent to their businesses. We have restaurants that aren't doing well. Um, we have a whole lot of things that need attention in our region, and having vacant space is is never is mm, never good, yeah. right? So there's there's value in bringing new business, breathing new life into our downtown space. Um, and all across. I mean, the same is true. We have vacancy all over our region. So, you know, Roseville, Rockland, Folsom, Rancho Cordova, Elk Grove, it, it's everywhere. Um, we've got to get some boots on the ground, but I don't think it looks like asking people to go back to being worker bees from eight to five and commuting. We need to reimagine what engagement looks like in your community from a worker standpoint. I do have a hold a belief system that 100% remote work, while it is good for some folks, uh, there is a large majority of folks that really aren't benefiting from not getting any interaction with coworkers, especially when we look to that next generation. I always think we have a debt to pay to the next generation from all the cool stuff that we got the benefit of when we were younger. If you're a new college grad or a new high school grad and you're going into the workforce, if it's in a remote and fully remote environment today, you're not going to be listening to the person um, who's having a conversation with their co coworker about how they did something in Excel or how they were able to do something with a new technology or they're selling something and you're just ear hustling and hearing that expertise. There's no mentorship taking place from just observing one another. And that is a very important thing to cover that gap that's so hard from that 18 to 25 in that first job space to really pick up job skills. And if we don't do something about that, then we're going to have this 10, 15, however many year population of early workers that are singular functional because they're not getting those, oh, I think I might be interested in HR because that sounded so cool. Or I think I might like accounting because I saw this chart that they were working on and that looked interesting to me. It sparked joy. And there's there's a there there in that space, whether it's yeah. through co-working spaces or intentional collisions, there's a something to do well, there. Well, I think there's a takeaway there too for people who are, let's say you're in high school or college, you're thinking about what you want to be when you grow up, which is a lot mm -hmm. of us, maybe choose an occupation or a, a career path that Put you, you know, don't choose the remote uh, <laughs> worker uh, over work, being the remote worker over someplace where you can maybe have either hybrid or you know an opportunity to engage with the CEO or or even the other people that you know have information that you don't have and sure. th this stuff just doesn't come up, you know it doesn't come out typically on a you know a ten person Zoom call sure. right as much yeah yeah and there is onus on the person right but there is also this thing we do as a community where we say it's super sexy to be a hundred percent remote so you're missing out if we you're do not. who says oh. that well everyone everyone wants I mean here let me put it to you this way statistically I can tell you that our entry level job is a call center employee and we probably have two dozen jobs in our company that are call center employees, okay? The last open position we had for a call center employee, in 26 hours, we had over 5,000 applications for that wow. job. You know how to market for a position. <laughs> we don't market. I mean, this is how what I'm saying. How do you get 5,000 job applicants for a call center job. We list the job on LinkedIn and we wow. had over 5,000 applications. So what that tells me is that people are looking for uh -huh. that remote. Okay. It's the sexy thing. It's the hotness, right? Okay, and, but that's coming from the employee uh, perspective right. is that it's sexy to be a remote worker sure. versus, because I, I'm thinking about the employers that I talk to and some of them have been sort of forced to go uh, remote. And mm -hmm. you look at what Elon Musk did uh, when he basically, you know, c did a culture shift more, more recently when yep. in Twitter and you know, you're coming to the office. And so I'm seeing almost like a pendulum swing back and too. maybe even a desire from employer from, from the employer standpoint, 
to get people back into the office. Otherwise, because they're seeing an erosion in culture. Sure. We're seeing a power dynamic shift, right? Mm. We're definitely seeing it move from the employee space to the employer space. And now it is super important what the employers do with that power because they can go back to where we were before, where we have this environment that you are the ruler who's in charge of everything and you lay hard, fast rules, or we can have more of an engagement that is a relationship or a partnership with your employees or a contract, if you will, that it will look like this. And this is how maybe they only come in a couple days a week. Maybe they come in a day a month. I don't know what that looks like, but the cost is still the same for the employer in that you know physical space. But the employee gets to have some flexibility in choosing what that engagement might look like. Hmm. I'm thinking about that because a lot of people are trying to decide what they want to be when they grow up. I yeah. mean, we all are. Me too. Whenever we go, yeah, I mean, it's probably continues throughout our life, but especially when there's a transition. So after I sold my companies, I, you know, what do I want to be now and all that. So there are these times when you just have these turning points where you're like, what do I want to be? Mm-hmm. And so I like this, um, this topic a lot. And you mentioned you worked at Denny's. And yeah. so I, and I hear people saying working in, I never, I worked at a video store, but I never worked in the food space. Mm-hmm. But people say to work in those, that type of a job is kind of invaluable for their human relations skills, which is a big part of winning as a employee yeah. or as an entrepreneur. Yeah. My favorite job was working at Denny. Really? Oh, I which, loved which it. Which one did you work at? I started at the one at Auburn in 80. Oh, no, sorry. That was my third one. The first one was at Madison and Fair Oaks where they came together. Okay. I got hired on my 16th birthday and started oh, the next day. Wow. And then I moved to Elk Grove, the one on Elk Grove Boulevard. Okay. And then I transferred to Auburn and 80. Auburn and 80. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Um, because the, and you were a server, it sounds like. I was least. a hostess to start. Okay. And then I moved to a server after I turned 18. And then what did you, okay. What did you get out of that that uh, maybe you wouldn't have gotten if you would have got a job, let's call it doing daycare for, you know, daycare or something like that? I don't know if I would like from daycare. I mean, food service, you obviously learn a lot about the speed of food and temperatures. And as an entrepreneur, it was interesting to learn the dynamic of the the numbers, right? Mm-hmm. How quickly checks are supposed to move and how oh, you yeah, make it yeah. profitable. Because I have one of those yeah, what math kind of brains. Night, what, do we have a big night tonight? <laughs> right. and, uh, what were my what tips looking mean? like? Yeah, that's yeah. how mean. you adjust staffing based on how busy you are. I mean, you learn a lot of those things. Yeah. Whereas in childcare, the ratios exist no matter what, right? You're right. one to three or one to four or one to seven based on the age of the child. Yeah. Just picked a, a yeah, thing yeah. like it's like <laughs> there's because being a uh, a server, mm-hmm. you're gonna serve all kinds, especially in a Denny's. Yeah. You're gonna get yeah. all kinds yeah. in any restaurant, but totally, especially at Denny's, <laughs> right? You're gonna have the old people coming in for the senior yep. discount, like yep. me. I would probably get it now. Um, and <laughs> then you've got you know people late night after partying and totally. have to have, go get something to eat so they can yep. you know. We had cute old couples that would come in and share the pot roast together as dinner. And that was one dinner. And they were so sweet. I learned a lot about humanity when one of those old couples, one of the spouses would pass away. And I would just sit with them or see the manager sitting and talking to them and learning that that human piece matters, that we'd become a family. Um, My coworkers, we all depended on each other. And if you had a good relationship, people would run food for each other, pick it up or take care of each other. Um, I learned a lot about deep cleaning, which is not my favorite thing (laughs) on the planet. Um, But I learned that there are some people who are really good at it and there are people like me that aren't that great at it. Um, And I also learned just a lot about how to be kind to people and um, always walk around with something in your hands. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Make efficient use of your time really was the lesson in that. But no, I loved it. I made great tips and I got to walk around and smile and just be human with people and give them love hugs on their way out with my words and it was great. So you joined the Entrepreneurs Organization. Mm -hmm. What do you think? You know, starting out, I was unsure. I was definitely unsure. It's definitely a masculine vibe. Because I'm always promoting it. But (laughs) look, a lot of my friends are guys, right? So I recruit a lot of guys into EO. And they're great guys. Yeah. Yeah. I really wasn't sure. I, I, um, I, I mean, I've, I'm a guy's girl. I've grown up around cars and limos and old cars and, and always traveling in that space and, and that industry. And coming in, it felt a little nostalgic, right? Mm. Because it felt like hanging out with my dad and his friends. Yeah. Um, and it, 
at the first few months, I was like, okay, okay, I see, I can see where this is going. I love the structure that the EOS system brings. I mean, that is like top notch, mm-hmm. really important you stuff. Use that a clutch. We just implemented the level 10 a few months ago, but okay. we are moving forward with the full EOS system. Yeah. And anybody who's listening, what, what is EOS? It's sort of a, uh, a system where you can organize your business through, and a lot of it's around communication and, you know, communicating the vision and the mission and the, they call them rocks, but sort of the goals and initiatives. So it really keeps you on track in a, in a level 10 meeting has to check these boxes in order to be an effective meeting. Yes. So just to kind of give the synopsis on that. Yeah. And so you like that. I like it. I like it a lot. The whole team has loved it. For everyone now, it's a 10 out of 10, and we're starting to roll that out into our various departments, which is great. Uh, And for me, it took getting from our forum into retreat. We just had a retreat a couple of weeks ago, and now I cannot imagine my life without my forum. I mean, what an incredible incredible bonding experience that was. We all just bared our souls and loved on each other and got to, we went through each other's PLs, which was a really wonderful thing to do together. Oh, wow. That's very in, could be considered invasive. Well, I mean, if you all sign an uh, you know, NDA to each other and you mm-hmm. really believe in confidentiality. And I mean, here's the thing I will tell you, Mark, like I'm one of the more transparent people in the world and sometimes that gets me into trouble. But that credit union background is about people helping other people. I would send my business plan to other financial institutions. And that was something that our old CEO, Henry Worse, would always say, like, it it doesn't matter what you share about your business with other people. You're the secret sauce. You're the something special. It's actually the people that move business. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can pretty much Google anything you need to know about business. Everything is now available for free these days. It's about the person choosing to engage with it is where the magic really happens in an organization. I love that. I love that. Okay. So final question. What did I not ask you? What else, what maybe like words of wisdom that maybe we haven't covered to maybe an aspiring entrepreneur or an entrepreneur out there that aspires to do something like what you're doing? Because it's, <laughs> it is inspiring to, to think about building a 200 person company that's in route to a thousand. That motivates me a lot. Yeah, I would say if there's an aspiring entrepreneur, like someone who really isn't sure, you know, do I want to do this? Do I not want to do this? Um, for me, it was choosing to bet on myself, right? If I, I said, and if we were a stock, I would buy us. And that was the mm. final, like, it's time. We need to step out. We need to try this. Um, I, if you feel tired of like, what if, I mean, seriously, I invented pet grass and I didn't do anything with it. And then like eight years later, pet grass was everywhere. And I was so oh. mad at myself, <laughs> like this could have been my thing, you know? And you have all these ideas. There's, you can make money doing anything. It's just about how you commit to it and how much vision you can have around it. So try your hand at something. I firmly believe in, and we support in our culture, try the side hustle thing, do it from a place of safety. Be honest with your employer in that space and be transparent. I mean, if it's not a conflict of interest, people don't own you. Your employer does not own you and all of your time exclusively. And if you're not an employer who supports that, find a different employer, Mm -hmm. quite frankly. Um, And then run, if you are still at work at a corporate place or whatever, run it like your business. Mm. That's, I mean, I think entrepreneurially. Yes, absolutely. And then from there, I, I guess I would just say, there's that golden rule, right? About treating other people the way you'd want to be treated. I, I know we're all a little hardened in the entrepreneurial space because you get burned, you love on people, they take advantage of you. I know these things happen, but that's on them. Yeah. Your job is to keep doing it the way you would want to do it. And you do it with free abandonment, you do it with total love and honesty and respect. And yes, people will take advantage of you and most people won't. And most people are going to help protect the beautiful thing that you're building. And I think if we if we all do business a little more in that way, we're all better for it at the end of the day. Yeah. Most people are good. Yeah. Um, Rachel Zillner, uh, thank you for coming on the show, sharing yeah. your story. I think a lot of people in Sacramento and the Sacramento region are already inspired by you, but anybody who 
uh, met you uh, through this today, I, I know is inspired. So thank you for being here and for what you're doing for our community. Thanks for the invitation. It's always fun to hang with you, Mark. You bet. <laughs> Thanks for watching today's show. My goal for every episode is that you find a takeaway, something tangible you can use in your business today. And if you have a comment about a favorite takeaway, feel free to put it in the in the box below. And if you have a, a topic that you'd like me to bring up on the show, don't forget to let me know. And also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel if you want to learn more about entrepreneurship. Because at Haney Biz, we are always by your side.